Hello, you're listening to High Visibility. This is a podcast produced by Art of the Rural and Plains Art Museum that welcomes into conversation artists, culture bearers, and leaders from across rural America in Indian country. It's offered in conjunction with the High Visibility Exhibition, a collaboratively curated effort currently on view at Plains Art Museum through May 30th, 2021. My name is Matthew Fluharty, and I'm the organizing curator. In the months ahead, I'll be with you, along with other hosts from the Plains Art Museum and beyond, as this podcast shares the richly divergent stories, lived experiences, and visions of folks across the continent. You can learn more about visiting the High Visibility Exhibition by heading to plainsart.org. We also welcome folks to check out the High Visibility site at inhighvisibility.org, where we offer show notes and transcriptions of our conversations, alongside further information on the individuals and work discussed here. We're grateful for the support of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and the National Endowment for the Arts making this endeavor possible. And we welcome folks to check out and subscribe to these conversations on their favorite podcast platforms. Today we have the chance to speak with Jovan C. Speller and to learn more about the experiences that shaped her ongoing Relics of Home project and the installation in Lottie's room that is currently on view at the Plains Art Museum. We're publishing this selection from our larger conversation, so chances are, if you're listening to this now, there's an even deeper conversation available with Jovan to enjoy wherever you listen to podcasts. Jovan's work bridges visual art, writing, and performance with a research practice that she describes as centered around elevating, complicating, and inventing stories that explore ancestry, identity, and spatial memory making the intangible tangible and the invisible visible. Jovan C. Speller is currently focusing on expanding her art practice and experimenting with installation and sound works as an artist resident at Second Shift Studio Space in St. Paul, Minnesota. She is the recipient of numerous grants, including a McKnight Visual Artist Fellowship and a Jerome Emerging Artist Fellowship. Her photographic works have been published and exhibited in various exhibitions throughout the United States. Jovan holds a BFA in photography from Columbia College, Chicago, and studied art at Maryland Institute College of Art. Folks can learn more about her work at jovanspeller.com. This conversation was recorded in February, 2021, and it ranges across a field of artistic, familial, spiritual, and historical forces that her work so subtly interweaves. I'm so grateful for Jovan's connective vision in this conversation, for how, on one hand, we have the opportunity to understand how a body of work deepens around a set of questions over time. But I'm also grateful for how she offers all of us new orientations, new ways into thinking around some of the most central imperatives of our shared cultural moment. What follows is a meditation on origin stories of black culture and the potential for intercultural exchange with indigenous communities. And also a long-term cultivation of various artistic and research practices that can witness and address legacies of nostalgia, trauma, and cultural change through an attention to the land itself. Jovan references a few projects we'll share in the show notes so folks can dive deeper. The first is Relics of Home, a long-term effort that takes root in her family's multi-generational stewardship of land in Windsor, North Carolina, on acres once tended by her enslaved ancestors. We also discuss in Lottie's Room, an installation that brings those family stories into photographic and material presence in a reimagined structure from that land. Our conversation begins with Jovan sharing Choosing Home, an evolving collaboration with Diani Whitehawk, that began as a one-night visual inquiry supported by MN artists at the Walker Arts Center. Through a wide-ranging event featuring performances, conversations, and video installations, Jovan and her collaborators created a space to sit with these questions. Those with the privilege of power over this land, the United States, Jovan wrote, proclaim that it has no official language, that it is made up of immigrants, 
in a place where freedom reigns. It was said to be a safe haven, a new start, a dream. But what is home without the recognition and reconciliation of myths used as tools to manipulate and oppress generations of peoples? What is home when complicated by centuries of radical and violent displacement, forced relocation, captivity, migration, and colonization? This selection from our conversation begins here with choosing home and in how the act of braiding hair became a bridging space for these collaborations. So, without further ado, please settle in and enjoy our conversation with Jovan C. Speller. I was actually, at the time of working on Choosing Home and kind of conceiving of it, I was also at the same time starting to get images of what would later be relics of home. And it was really this exploration of defining home and origin stories and tracing back origin stories in Black culture in particular and in Black families. But I felt really, if I was going to honestly look at ideas of home and origin, it was difficult to imagine doing that without at least starting the conversation about indigenous bodies and indigenous people and culture and the overlaps between African Americans and Native Americans in this country. Because what is home? (laughs) You can't talk about home in America without talking about (laughs) indigenous people. Um, And so I felt very uncomfortable doing that. And so I, at the time, really admired Deani Whitehawk's work and the way that she spoke about her work and, and and her family and identity. And I believe emailed her or called her. I don't even remember how I got her information, but we did not know each other at the time, but we had a phone call and instantly were speaking the same language. And we both were looking for like, we were curious about each other. You know, I think that's where things have to begin, you know, And the only thing, you know, that we knew was there was similarity in ritual in our cultures. And so that we we really started to explore that. We, you know, talked about relationships with the land and stewarding the land and honoring land. But we really came back, you know, she and I are both really close to our mothers. And that led us to specifically um, like uh, caring, caring of generations and caring of women and passing knowledge. And that led us to hair braiding. So uh, I think also at the time, she and I were both really interested in creating uh, and working in film. And I had been working on a film idea for Relics of Home. And she had been working on a film idea, which I think is now at the Kemper Museum. Um, So she's fully executed hers. And so we wondered if we could work with uh, a filmmaker to kind of create this little explorative short, you know, about hair braiding. And so she and I both interviewed our mothers separately about their relationship with hair a relationship to hair, with hair in culture, and uh, the history of their hair story. And then we kind of created this generational overlap by shooting aunties braiding their niece's hair. Yeah, so that was that was that collaborative work. And we debuted that at Choosing Home, a right, a privilege, or an act of trespass. So that was my question, just about choosing home in general. Was it a right? Was it a privilege? Or was it an act of trespass? And it's all of the above, but I wanted to explore those different avenues into home. So that's what that presentation at the Walker was really about. What I would like to share just for folks who are listening would be to welcome them to check out the show notes for our podcast, uh, where we can link to what I thought was a, a pretty wonderful video that they made that, that Twin Cities 
public television made of that evening and also of your work. Um, the video begins with some, we're able to visualize the photographic process that you mentioned earlier. Uh, it just was, it was, I thought it was a really beautiful video in terms of how it connected your creative work to the curatorial work as well. Uh, it's re really awesome, high quality video. And so I'm, I'm wondering that if we, if we could just continue the thread and I'm, I'm curious as, as the filmmaking process kind of concluded and, and as that evening at the Walker with choosing home um, happened and, and then opened up the reflective space that it, it probably did for you. How, how did Relics of Home continue to emerge and take shape after choosing home? Yeah, so that was, that. it's interesting. So one like important detail in there is that when I was working on choosing home, I was eight and nine months pregnant and the presentation debuted, uh, I believe it was like May 7th. And then on May 9th, I had my first child. So... Yeah, so I was, so like disclaimer, if you're looking at that video, I'm super shiny, super pregnant, real swollen. There's a reason I was nine months pregnant, okay? Um, so, but, um, but there was this like great momentum, this kind of converging of the stars after we finished that, um, that presentation because I felt it even more urgent and more important to understand origin and reconcile my issues, perhaps is the right word, issues with not knowing like the full story. And no, there's, I have not yet met a black person who is a descendant of a slave um, that knows the full story, like where you're from and can really track back to African culture or a specific African culture or country that really can inform identity, ritual, spirituality, right? Those, like, again, that has been a continuum in my exploration and my research. I've wanted to connect back authentically to some spiritual ritual. So I was really feeling this intense urgency of needing to reconcile that need, that feeling of there is something that I don't know, there's something missing, because I understand generational trauma and did not want to carry mine forward through to my child more than I already had. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it was really interesting because it required generations of my family to be involved in the project in order to make it happen. So, you know, my brother accompanied me to Windsor, North Carolina. I was, I think Silas, my firstborn, he was likely four months on that trip. My father drove up from Georgia, I think, to meet his grandson and introduce me to some relatives. My mother drove up from Tennessee to hang out with her grandson while I was off shooting. And my uncle, I my uncle Wayne, I think he was in New York at the time. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I don't, no, I can't remember. But he, um, he, he goes back and forth between North, North Carolina and New York. So I don't remember where he was living at the time, but I remember picking him up at, uh, maybe it was Asheville, in Asheville, before we went to, to Windsor. So we endeavor with all of these relatives and with it, all of their drama <laughs> that I did not know about, right? Um, with family comes drama and trauma. But, um, you know, I didn't know that my father and my uncle had not been speaking because of something that happened right there on that land. I didn't know that these relatives that I had not yet met 
had been a part of like this drama of, you know, what happened right before my father sold that land. So there was like, you can call it kind of two camps in the family, those who wanted to keep the land and those who wanted to sell it and didn't think it was worth anything. And I think that for me, in my generation, I couldn't understand how anyone would think that the land wasn't worth anything when it held all of this history, when it held the blood of our ancestors and the bodies of our ancestors on some parts of the property. How could that not be enough value? And, you know, that goes back to white is right. But anyway, you know, understanding our own value within our community, within our culture is also work. Making this happen was really like kind of being this cross between, you know, a researcher, an artist, photographer, mother, niece, daughter, and kind of like anthropologist <laughs> as well. Um, and so I had to put on all of these many hats while also learning how to be a mom <laughs> and uh, fighting off the ginormous bugs that are in the kind of like, what? <laughs> what? they're huge. They're like three inches and swarming around you. Anyway, so, you know, so there was a lot, there was a lot, there was a lot to battle. There was a lot to contend with, both physically and just the logistics of being in that kind of new terrain. And then in terms of access, because technically we had sold this land, but my uncle still owned a trailer that was on part of the land. And then the farm had been sold later and was overgrown. But the house was was sold, but broken into already. So it was open. So there were all of these like questions of like access of trust. Am I trespassing? Am I not? Whose property is this? There were all these questions of ownership. So basically, when I got there, it was not a straightforward story. And I thought I was going to find a straightforward authority. And that's just like my general optimism. <laughs> Like that, like I thought that I would find this, you know, um, oh, I'll just kind of take my, I remember my original proposal because I did have to write a grant to get the funds to go do this work. But my original proposal was to sh depict these, uh, the land almost as a portrait, right? So it, I wasn't going to take landscape images. I was going to take a portrait of the land and discover kind of like, who is this land, right? And personify it. And then when I got there, I couldn't separate the people from the place. I don't know why I thought that I could, but I couldn't separate the people from the place. I couldn't st separate the stories or the trauma. And so it became this really complicated, really layered thing, which then made me call on that technique of layering and cutting apart um, images and putting them back together in a more narrative way. So yeah, that's how that came to be visually and i think um you know the all of the people involved like the the work wouldn't be the work with all of the people in the involved and all of the their level of openness with me and sharing their side of the story their memories their myths you know the, all of those all of those voices really shape the work it's powerful you know because for folks who have been to the plains art museum to see high visibility the work that is in those galleries in Lottie's room it feels like an extension of the work you're describing. And there, there's a quality between, between all of this work uh, that, that really came to the fore as, as you were just sharing all of this, Jovan. And, and it's this notion of time and notions of nostalgia, you know, and, and nostalgia as a Western concept. You know, when we go back to the Greek, it means lost home. And nostalgia really has been since since the Greek and Roman Empire, an element that has been weaponized for ideological and political ends. And we've seen so much of it in in recent memory as well. So there's that tradition, but there's like this this other tradition that replacing home. I believe number one, replacing home number one, which carries forward the collage practices you were talking about earlier in Black Quiet. 
and uh, folks will we'll link to this in in the show notes as well so folks can see the image uh, but that is a really powerful image <laughs> i just i'd keep going back to it and you know we, when we were preparing for this uh this conversation i, I shared this quote uh, but the uh, artist, performing artist, essayist, director, Daniel Alexander Jones shared this quote by Alice Coltrane with me a couple years ago, where she's talking about ancestors. And I, I don't have it exactly correct, but hopefully it, it hits the same spiritual tone where she says, they will be there. They will be there in translinear light. And I, and I, I, came, I came to that quote because there's something in the spirit of what Alice Coltrane shares that absolutely resists the really linear and very restri restrictive nature of the kinds of straight up nostalgia we see, straight up white nostalgia we see in rural America and that is superimposed upon landscapes. And, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm curious about, about that work replacing home one and maybe more broadly about, about Relics of Home and in Lottie's Room, the work that's at the Plains Art Museum, and, and how it's meditating on, on these notions of time, but how, how much more fluid and embodied they may be than we might think they are at, at first glance. Yeah, so I think that one of the things that was really important to me was being able to capture a sense of the place so that it could feel like now. I, I, I think for me, for some reason, the fact that Black Quiet was so steeped in nostalgia was a bit of a failure. And so I was trying to figure out how to grow as an artist and how to, to better reflect the stories that I was trying to tell. And so that led me to shoot in color, which that was, that's my first color series. Like I said, I love being in the dark room. And so there aren't many color dark rooms. I haven't seen a color dark room since I graduated college. So, um, so yeah, that was my first color series. And I tried to create a way of working that was similar to my dark room pra practice, though, where there was no like digital manipulation, right? There might have been like a like the same level of like a color cast correction that you could do in the dark room, right? But I wasn't correcting to get a perfect image. I was correcting to get it to feel like the place and look like the place, how I saw it that day. And so that image, Replacing Home 1, first of all, that's the first time I used that technique in this way, in this series, the cutting and layering. I was trying to tell this like really complicated story about that particular spot on the land that that outline is of the house is the trailer that my uncle owns and it was like disputed like does he own the land underneath it also if so then this is the last bit of land that we have from the acreage that we were given and then you can see the 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 like the line in the grass where the lawnmower has started and stopped that's the actual border between the 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 land underneath the trailer and like what we think he owns and the beginning of the actual fields the farmland where my father had already sold that or maybe my i think my grandmother actually sold that farm to the person who was renting it, I believe somebody sold it. But so that's that border, that borderline, physical, physical borderline of that grass, which is like this hard edge that I really um, loved its representation. And then filling in the, the silhouette of the house are like, that's a view of the farm right now. Like that's a view of that land. It's just eight feet of weeds. and. I also wanted to bring the, like, depict the land as a home, as shelter, because literally it is where our ancestors live, is underground in that land, but also just spiritually, it's where all of those kind of lost souls, like where I imagine them. 
So I wanted to bring them home. And I think that that is that idea of bringing ancestors home, at least inviting them into my spiritual home as like a reconciliation, as an honoring, as a closing the gap between then and now and me and them creating the us and we. I think that structure, that house structure became really key in this series. So the installation at the Plains is a physical home structure that I got to encase and enclose these really important moments within that study of fam- family history. You know, I got to enclose it and encase it and give it voice. And it's the voice is my great aunt Lottie. And she is telling stories about the family, right? That I had never heard about my great grandfather and how he was poisoned. That was one of the many stories that she told me. That's the one that plays on a loop in that space. And there is an image of her hanging in that space. And Uh, You know, I went back and forth to North Carolina a few times, and that's exactly where she sat, how she sat, and how she looked each time I went. So that was, you know, that's just like for me, for me, like that's quintessential great Aunt Lottie. She, She was my grandmother's youngest sister. Her voice is also significant because she sounds exactly like my grandmother. So it was this familiar sound that was so necessary you know, like my grandmother's passed away. And so like hearing her again, it was like I was reconnected with my grandmother. You know, it was surreal. Um, But there is this sense of like, I am home, even though I've never met this person, or even though I've only sat with this person three times in my life, I am home, right? There's that like continuation of um, genetic fiber, right? Like we're all stitched together. And so that was like a, an audio kind of version of that or reminder of that. And then there's an image of a, I think, third cousin, Rache, who lives in that trailer. So he's like the last relative that is physically connected to that space, the last living relative, right? He lives on that land still. And then there is the picture in the thick where I'm standing on the porch of the house that was my grandfather's and, you know, that has been sold. And so it's just like a field of weeds. That's the front yard with my uncle and my third cousin, you know, talking beyond it about they were actually talking about fixing the roof of the trailer. Um, But, you know, it's I don't know. There's. Also, the the one of the reasons that I love that image is because my uncle is in like his Sunday best. He is Sunday. It doesn't matter where he is. He's he has to wear his loafers and his khakis and a white shirt that's tucked in and a belt. And I'm just like, you know, we're going out into the field, right? He's just like, it's Sunday. <laughs> like, okay, cool. So, um, so there was the you know that was just like a moment I had. I kind of had to capture. Um, he's so out of place, but it's his, but he actually is the like closest, he's the person who took care of that, of that land and of that property when nobody else in the family cared about it. So I needed to kind of memorialize him and my cousin in that these are the ones that still care. I do think that there is this, like, because, like, if the origin story is essentially the definition of nostalgia, which is lost home, right? If, if that's what I'm trying to reconcile as this lost home, then c- perhaps I could just create one, right? I think that that's where we all land is like, it's gone. I have to move forward. How do I move forward? But I do feel like that tension, that sadness around that loss and all of the tragedies that exist within the origin, um, all of that is now laid to rest. You've been listening to High Visibility, a podcast produced by Art of the Rural and Plains Art Museum. Please join the conversation at plainsart.org.